Okay, uh, I want to introduce Jim Birch uh, to give the keynote talk. And um, I've known Jim almost a half a century. Uh, we arrived at Rice uh, one year apart, uh, Jim in 64, and I was there in 65. Uh, it's been delightful to know him and interact with him. We worked together at NASA in Huntsville for a while before Jim went home to San Antonio uh, to Southwest Research, where he's had a distinguished career. Jim continued the Yosemite tradition um, very extensively through these years since the mid-70s, and has I don't know how many meetings it's been, Jim, but I know a lot. I don't either. That you and your <coughs> folks have been have been here, and have facilitated this. Um, Jim's made tremendous contributions, as you all know, in space physics, and I thought I might show you what Jim did scientifically um, when he was about 30 years old. So let's see. The third case is the one I'm going to talk about, and that's where you have a substorm and you produce a, a region of detached plasma in the afternoon sector or, or a plasma tail or some isolated region of cold plasma. Uh, the protons and electrons that are injected during the substorm or during the magnetic storm can have the possibility then of drifting into the detached region or isolated plasma region. It uh, might not be that simple because this uh, plasma region is going to have a drift motion as well, and so when the satellite passes through, you don't really know how long before you went through the energetic particles reached the isolated plasma region. Also on S cubed, the apogee is only five and a quarter Earth radii. So in fact, we've looked at about eight or nine months of data when, when the uh, apogee of the satellite was out in the region where these uh, isolated regions occur in the afternoon sector. We found only four cases, and all of these that happened were in the main phase of magnetic storms. That is, they were probably isolated regions or detached regions at other times, but they were just simply beyond the S cubed orbit. And so it turns out that in all of these cases, we had a hot plasma distribution in the ring current. The plasma sheet was driven in, drifted into the isolated region, but in all cases, the beta of the plasma was at least one. And so these calculations of ion cyclotron turbulence, the uh, resonant energy that Don Williams was talking about really doesn't apply because those calculations are made for uh, in the low beta limit. And so we have to <laughs> consider uh, possibilities such as the high beta cyclotron ion cyclotron instability or the electrostatic ones that, that Dick Thorne was, was talking about, and I'm not qualified. Okay, Jim Birch. Follow me? Yep. All right. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Rick. I think, uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, past and future. I left out the present because this meeting is about the present. This whole week we'll be hearing about that. The past uh, didn't start at Yosemite 1974, but you could have seen it from there. I think that's where magnetosphere ionosphere coupling uh, really did start. And it's got a bright f uh, future and it's a large topic. When Rick asked me to do this, I had to think about it a little while. It's a big job, but then I realized I owe him a lot of favors more than anybody else I know, so it didn't take long at all. So now I had to narrow it down by leaving out the present. I also narrowed it down topically to uh, things that I've worked on and maybe know things about. So a lot of the things I talk about actually started in around 74, real close to 74. Some of the things I talk about started a little after that. But there were big topics at that meeting, hot topics, that I haven't worked on since, I don't know enough about. I'm not going to cover them, but I'll, uh, I can talk about a few or mention a few. One was the Chattanooga radar. Uh, Joe Dupnik was here and made a big splash talking about the first view we had of global electric fields. Of course, that's uh, continued. So that's an uh, example of one of the things I don't talk about. So if I don't talk about your favorite topic, it's just because I'm ignorant or haven't worked on it. So here's the outline, things I will talk about. Uh, SAR arcs was a hot topic at Yosemite. As you'll see in a minute, uh, it hasn't been a whole lot of work done since then. hasn't been solved. Plasmosphere drainage plumes, another hot topic. A lot of work has been done. Ring current decay, another hot topic that I think is still uh, being debated just as hotly now, perhaps. Uh, auroral acceleration uh, is another topic that's undergone a big change since then. AKR was 
discovered in 1974, but as far as I know, was not presented at this meeting. Uh, dispersive alphane waves really came up uh, a little bit after that meeting. Ion outflow, we knew nothing about at that meeting. Uh, Dick Johnson talked about precipitation of energetic heavy ions. This is a very uh, hot topic that shocked a lot of people and surprised a lot of people, but the observations of ion outflow by people here like Plump and uh, Andrew Yao and other people came just a few years later. And then now, uh, currently, in the things going on in the other planets like Saturn. Then I'd like to talk about future, both in modeling and in future missions. Now, so I mentioned SAR arcs. There was uh, Dick Koch here had just published a review paper in Reviews of Geophysics in 73. It's a pretty current paper right now. Uh, Banford Reese gave a talk at Yosemite on it. And they both were talking about this uh, electron heating that happens during magnetic storms. So it could either be by Coulomb collisions, could be by uh, hydromagnetic waves that go into Cherenkov or Landau resonance with the ionospheric electrons, or it could be by uh, direct influx of energetic electrons. I don't think it's that last one, but it still could be either one or two. And this picture here on the right is uh, from Janet Kozira and Andy Nagy's review paper in 97 concluding that it's mostly the uh, collisions between uh, ring current plus and plasmaspheric thermal electrons. But then uh, here in uh, DE, that may be the first uh, picture of a SAR arc from space by Craven. It's a paper there that I'll mention where it looked like it was consistent with this Hasegawa and Mima theory of uh, Landau resonance. So I don't think we know the answer there. This is in, uh, the data. That from DE that shows a spectrogram here, a circle there is where the, you can see the heated electrons. Upper right shows a profile of light from the SAR arc, and the bottom is a distribution function showing that downward V parallel enhancement of electrons. So Gergiolo and myself and others, we uh, thought this was consistent with the Hasegawa and Mima theory, which was an application of Hasegawa's auroral theory that I'll talk about in a minute from a, two years earlier, but it hadn't really been picked up for the aurora, but for SAR arcs, it seemed to be a good theory, but then there's Kozira's uh, uh, Reviews of Geophysics paper that concludes that it's uh, O plus collisions. Now, there's a recent paper by Michael Mandillo, 2012, where a SAR arc was observed over Europe, and he made a list just uh, like I showed a minute ago, ionospheric heating, electron heating. He didn't show the mechanism. I don't think we know the mechanism. If we did, I think he would have said it. Now, a hot topic at Yosemite 74 was plasmosphere drainage plumes. We had uh, people here like uh, Abel Chin, Joe Grabowski uh, had a paper, and Grabowski in 1970, on the left here, you see with time, the times there, the hours after the onset from zero out, 10 hours, you see that drainage plume in the uh, afternoon sector. And then Chin, uh, same Chin with Dick Wolf had uh, published his paper on the right in 1972. And you can see there the rather narrow plasma tail on the left part of it, and on the right part of the picture, you can see some multiple tails that are wrapping around. Okay, remember these two pictures? And now here's the image uh, view. So on the left, you see the drainage plume on the right-hand side of that picture. You can see a lot when you look down at the, with EUV, resonantly scattered ultraviolet, from sunlight, so you're looking at helium here in the uh, plasma sphere. So you see the drainage plume, looks just about like predicted. Also see the air glow, the aurora. You see features like the shoulder on the lower left that we uh, found was actually caused by uh, IMF, uh, northward transitions in the solar wind. If you look on the right, uh, I think you can still see it. Look on the right hand. Uh, picture there as, this, as the plasma sphere develops during those substorms, and you can see multiple narrow plasma tails wrapped around the plasma sphere almost exactly like uh, Chin and Wolf's uh, picture that I showed a minute ago. So I think this is a major uh, advance, a lot of work still being going on, that we need more imaging. Now ring current decay, as I mentioned, was a hot topic. It was like it's either an electromagnetic ion cyclotron wave, a Doppler shifted resonance, or it's Coulomb collisions or its uh, charge exchange, and there were people arguing pretty strongly, and everybody knew, well, it's one of these, we don't know which. Well, now I think it's all of these, and that's how far we've come. We could still argue if we wanted to, but this is a very successful model, CCRM. This is Kozira, Fock, et cetera, 
and they can take data like here from Themis or from Image or from Twins and using mainly charge exchange, some uh, Coulomb collisions and sometimes they put in uh, cyclotron interactions with electrons but so they're not putting the ion uh, interaction. You could see here's the Themis data, here's some features, a notch there, a little bite out there. This is with the static magnetic field, still get this notch, but then when they have this self-consistent magnetic field that evolves with the uh, plasma, then you see more of the features. So this is a fairly uh, successful thing. It doesn't involve uh, ion cyclotron interactions, however, not to say they don't occur. And you can look here, as a, this is from image. One thing we uh, discovered here were these detached proton arcs because the image uh, with Stephen Mendy's camera had the ability to see proton auroras separately from electron auroras. And these would show up and under certain conditions. And uh, we found, okay, that they were associated with these drainage plumes. So here's some mapping of one of these arcs, not this one, but the similar one out here into the equatorial plane. Here's the boundary of the plasma sphere from imaging. And then at the same time, DE was measuring these ion cyclotron waves. Not exactly right there, okay, but close. And so here you have hydrogen helium cyclotron frequency. So we do know it's rich with these waves in these regions of uh, detached plasma or plasma plumes. So I think there's probably a lot there, the reason we can't nail it down is we don't really have the ability to determine the global distributions of ion cyclotron waves to put into a model. Now, I can remember distinctly at uh, Yosemite 74, Kent Ackerson showing, seemed like about 50 of these things. I, I, one of them looked different, except the common denominator was this uh, inverted V, and we, we all knew at the time from at Carl McElwain several years before from a sounding rocket had talked about this monoenergetic beam. So we all thought, okay, parallel electric fields, that's what's causing this. But there were, you know, deniers, just like uh, climate change and everything, always deniers. And so this was the data right here, these dots. And people said, well, look, if there's a parallel electric field there, where, how can these uh, low energy electrons be there? It seemed like everything would have been accelerated. This is because we had magnetosphere people not talking to ionosphere people. Well, Evans showed up at the meeting. This is really one of my favorite uh, pictures in space physics because when I saw it, I see it's one of these things. You say, man, this is cool. And I think of it. And he did it all on his own. And here's his model, solid line. And so he just said, well, there's a parallel electric field above. There are secondary electrons coming from the auroral precipitation from below. And the secondaries get trapped between the magnetic mirror and the uh, potential drop, and that's what these are, and that is what those are. So this happened, this was first announced in uh, Yosemite, 74, published in July, 74. Now, so we do know one of the things that occurs when you have inverted Vs, a parallel electric field, is you produce a density cavity. And when you have a density cavity, you have a resonant region there, a resonant cavity, actually, to produce uh, AKR. AKR was discovered in 74 by uh, Don Garnett here. I don't remember him being at uh, Yosemite or this topic even coming up, but there also was a Goddard group, Kaiser and Alexander, that discovered at the same time. They call it TKR, terrestrial kilometric radiation, and they, now it's been changed to rural kilometric radiation. So here it is. This is one of the uh, only times in space physics where there's been an elegant theory and then it survived for decades, and everybody agrees it's right. It's not the only case, but it's one of them. And this was C.S. Wu and Lou Lee back when Lou was at Maryland with the cyclotron maser interaction. You have to have this density cavity. You have electron cyclotron waves. You have higher density outside and lower density inside. So these waves can't escape until their frequency gets uh, above this exterior frequency, and then it can escape. But in the meantime, there are positive uh, density gradients in electron velocity space that can give rise to wave amplification. So it's just like there's a certain type of vacuum tube called a gyrotron that they use to heat plasmas in uh, tokamaks. Exactly the same thing. They use a CMI in a tube. So now you have this resonance condition here. It's an ellipse, but in this limit here, it's a circle in velocity space. It's pretty well known, but here is that circle. 
And so what Wu and Lee had in mind was this loss cone distribution. So this, uh, here again, Doug Minetti and I were working on this, trying to look at electrons when right in the AKR KR region, which we did. And so this is uh, probably what's happening, but there's also another feature up in here called the electron hole. And electron holes have been studied a lot since then, or maybe before then, I can't remember, but this is when I first saw them. So the beam is up here, the auroral beam, but the hole is in here. And we see these generally, um, or mostly when we're in the AKR region. And so that's 93, 20 years later here, this is turned sideways, but people talking about phase space gradients for AKR, still talking about loss cone electron holes. So I think it was sort of nailed down, but not uh, completely worked out. Now, the dispersive alphane waves, uh, I mentioned it in uh, connection with the SAR arcs, but the first paper Hasegawa did there, it was in 1976, and he had a theory for production of auroral arcs by dispersive uh, alphane waves. He was talking about uh, kinetic alphane waves, but I've learned uh, from Bill Lotko here that actually in the auroral region it's inertial alphane waves, but it doesn't matter. This uh, the alphane waves uh, is dissipated in topside ionosphere, and then it produces uh, parallel electric field components, and they're oscillatory, so that it would predict that you would have electron beams going both upward and downward. Well, look at Evans' <coughs> picture. Of course, we knew that wasn't happening. They're all coming downward, so I think that's why people didn't latch onto this theory until there started to be measurements <coughs> like this. They are from fast. The poles over here and the equator's down this way. So here's the inverted V. Here's the, <coughs> so this is the upward current region. Here's a downward current region where uh, you're not uh, seeing the inverted V because the, the potential drops in the other direction. And then here's the alphanic uh, region. So here you have a loss cone. Here you have counter streaming energetic electron beams. So this was uh, exactly what his theory predicted. So now people like his theory even though it languished for quite a while. And uh, now you would think, I would predict here, you don't see AKR mapped to the alphanic region. Could be wrong, but I would think if you have to have a density cavity, while well, that would be limited uh, to this region. So this is another very uh, current and future topic that didn't start at Yosemite 74, but it uh, started in soon thereafter. Now, ion outflow, as I mentioned earlier, we had uh, Dick Johnson. I think there's going to be a video talking about the precipitating O-plus ions during magnetic storms. This is a paper was first presented at the Spring AGU, uh, Sheraton Park, in 1972. It's one of those things you never forget. I walked in the session. The guy's talking about precipitating KEV O-plus ions, and it went against everything I'd ever been taught. And so Dick came to the meeting, talked about it. We still hadn't measured uh, out outflow. But as I mentioned uh, earlier, I think Andy Yao, Dave Klumpar, and Harry Collin, other people, uh, Ed Shelley, discovered the ion outflow, both in terms of beams and uh, conics. Uh, soon thereafter, maybe in the late 70s. So here's an example from uh, Christina. It's over here, Sar. Uh, here's another uh, pass of bass right here. And so. Uh, you can see a beam right here, right in the middle, or just above part of the uh, acceleration region for the inverted V. Then here you have uh, the other direction, the downward current region, and then over here you have the alphanic region. And in both of these, you mostly have conics. This is a pitch angle time spectrogram. So these are conics. There's the beam. We thought when these were first observed, it was perpendicular heating by waves, and they folded up according to conservation of first invariant. We know that's wrong because it doesn't matter what altitude you look at, they still have similar angles like that. Sometimes they're elevated like this, sometimes they're anchored at the origin, sometimes they're spread out, and sometimes they, they have a significant uh, downward component. So this is low altitude, inverted V, oscillating or alphanic, and then elevated. So there are all these different things. I think it uh, hasn't been worked out yet, but there's a lot of work going on and we really need uh, multiple spacecraft missions to figure out how the, these ions are accelerated and transported up the field line at the same time they're convected across field lines. So here's an example of some uh, current things. So here's uh, 
the uh, outflowing O+. Plus. This is mostly conics, so this is fast. He didn't really distinguish between conics and beams, but it's mostly conics. It's a night side and day side. If you say, well, it's associated with the uh, broadband electron power, this electron precipitation, you have this peak here. If it's associated with alvanic uh, pointing flux, you have peak on day side and night side. So that's the kind of thing. And then you have uh, Chaston talking about a density cavity here and how that might even give rise to conics inside the density cavity as well as outside where we normally think of them. So this is an active uh, area of research. Now I'm going to move to the outer planet, specifically Saturn, because that's the only outer planet I've worked on. And uh, so that entire magnetosphere is filled with ionospheric plasma. But as far as I can tell, not from Saturn. There may be some, but mainly from the moons, Enceladus and Titan. So we did here seven years of data, calculated uh, moments, got the density moments, see two populations. This is 10 Saturn radii out to uh, 25. So I just left out the inner part. But in here, inside this first ring is where Enceladus is, giving off plasma that's getting uh, transported outward by interchange instability. Now, when I studied magnetospheric physics, I was always taught about uh, interchange instability, but never saw an example of it in the magnetosphere. I mean, some people have claimed to see it, and I don't doubt that they did, but it's not a major phenomenon in Earth's magnetosphere. But it's everything in Saturn's magnetosphere. It's the main thing that's transporting plasma outward. So here's the plasma from Enceladus coming out. Here in this, I'll talk about in a minute, this is a plasma cam feature that we talk about. And then this ring out here is Titan. Interesting thing about Titan is it actually goes through the magnetopause. And uh, so this uh, is just an example of a magnetosphere where everything comes from uh, an ionosphere, but not the planet's ionosphere. So here's an example of the uh, interchange instability where you have low energy plasma and then high energy plasma coming from the outer magnetosphere in. The low energy plasma is going out in sort of a broad region. The inward Plasma is coming in in these narrow regions. And sometimes, not all the time, you see a magnetic field signature associated with this. And so this is a phenomenon that mainly transports plasma in Saturn's magnetosphere. Now, uh, possibly associated with that is the SKR. This was the first time that we had any idea of Saturn's rotation rate. It uh, came from SKR. Now, from, there are some other ways, looking at the gravity field and the planetary waves where people have got some measurements, these dashed lines here. This is the uh, SKR from Cassini. Started out here, we only saw this one population. This is from so uh, Southern Hemisphere, because Cassini was in Southern Hemisphere. This isn't much of a difference here, a few percent difference. But uh, so we said, well, is this a rotation rate or is it slipping? Probably is slipping because of uh, magnetospheric phenomena. We didn't know why, and a lot of theories came about one of which was that plasma cam I showed a minute ago. But there's so many theories, some having to do with uh, upper atmospheric storms, uh, magnetic cams, all kinds of things. It's not worked out by any means. But just when we thought we were converging, this other one popped up. This is the northern hemisphere. So now they're different. And then they crossed. And then it went away. So it's just really right now we're not exactly sure where we are. But anything you look at in Saturn, here's the uh, electrons magnetic field, they're all sitting there pulsating at the same frequency, which is close to the Saturn uh, orbital frequency. Now, SKR is a very interesting uh, phenomenon because if you compare it to AKR, it's X mode, circular polarization, opposite in the north and south because it follows the electron gyration. Everything just like AKR. So we say, well, it's cyclotron major instability also. and uh, AKR occurs on the night side. SKR occurs on the day side. I think there's one example of a night side or a couple, but for the most part, it's occurring at the magnetopause at around 11, 10 or 11 a.m. local time. AKR occurs at near midnight at the Earth. So that must mean there are density cavities along Saturn magnetic field lines, but they occur on the day side, where on the Earth they occur on the night side. So you know, if that's not a strong reason for, cut, for uh, studying, all the different planets. I don't know what, what one is. So we probably won't even solve it uh, with any. 
Yeah, so now I'll talk about the future a little bit. Numerical modeling started after Yosemite 74. I remember when it started, I was a little skeptical, but now it's a really big uh, activity in our field. And one of the things, at least in global modeling, I think that's held it back is the lack of uh, an ionospheric component. It's the same reason that uh, Rick and Peter and Andy started this meeting. And now only recently, 2013 here, is Bill Lotko, maybe he'll talk about it. Here's a sawtooth uh, uh, event. Don't put in ionospheric outflow. You don't get the sawtooth event. You put it in, you do get a sawtooth event. may not be exactly, but I think this is a major uh, advertisement for putting in ionospheric outflow. Now, the other thing that numerical modeling is used for is for kinetic phenomena like uh, reconnection. It's held back a little bit in the particle in cell code by the unrealistic mass ratios. Best for an explicit code I've seen is about 400. Instead of the 1836, it's there between hydrogen and electrons. Now, there are some implicit codes that can do the, the proper mass ratio, but it ends up uh, making some approximation and averaging over some things in the electron scales, so it can't really reproduce all the electron scales. But I think computers getting bigger and faster will solve this. In terms of future missions, Juno will arrive at Jupiter in 2016. Several people here are working on it. Polar orbit going in over the aurora, imaging the aurora, measuring all the different plasma and field things we're used to. It's got to stay out of the radiation, though. So we'll have one year, 33 orbits, uh, highly elliptical. But that will be able to uh, advance our knowledge of magnetosphere ionosphere coupling at Jupiter. Now, MMS has uh, been working on for a while now, and it's mainly a magnetosphere mission, but the uh, effect of heavy ions like ionospheric oxygen on the reconnection rate is a hot topic. We've designed a special instrument that's just focused on that. So when we launch sometime around the end of this uh, year, hopefully we'll uh, know what the effects of heavy ions are. There have been papers that have said that it makes it slower reconnection rate, some that says it's uh, higher or faster. So we'll find out. And finally, well, you know, I had a chance to stand up here. There's a mission called OMIC that I think is what needs to be done as far as magnetosphere ionosphere coupling. The strongest channel for that is in the auroral region. This mission was uh, in 2001, was almost selected, but Themis got selected in 2013, was almost selected, but ICON got selected. So this is not going to go away. It's like two fast satellites with global auroral imaging and fine scale auroral imaging. So, uh, you know, somebody will pose this and get selected at some point. That's the end of my talk. Any questions, I'll answer.